You're listening to Rock Solid People, a podcast by Max King. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Very pleased to welcome Sam Payer, the CEO and founder of The Growing Space, to uh, the podcast today. We are rock solid people. We have an interesting conversations with innovative individuals in the disability space. And I have to say, I feel very privileged and a little bit like, a little bit giggly, uh, like I've got a, a superstar here with me. So Sam. Oh, you're making me feel all weird, Max. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I was, I was reluctant to do that, but <laughs> I've been very, uh, very appreciative of your support, very, very appreciative of your time. And look, I, I have to say, we're in an interesting space and, and you are one of the people that I have since we set up Care Support looked up to uh, as an inspiration to what we do. So I'm very pleased that you're here. Sam, let's kick into, for those people who don't know the growing space, those very few people in the disability space that don't know, what, what is the growing space and what do you do and, and, and who are you? Sure. I am the mum of two kids with disability who are in the scheme. I am the CEO of the growing space and we offer support coordination services around South Australia and a few pockets around the country as well. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Independent Advisory Council for the NDIA and I think they're the important things. I do some other voluntary board bits and advocacy and systemic work but that's the core of it I think. Yeah that is the core and uh, you've just come from an IAC board meeting is that correct? I have. It was very interesting. We're uh, we're very meeting the new minister next week, so we were getting getting our stuff together to figure out what we're going to say and ask, and uh, what we're going to ask of the new minister. So that was pretty exciting, actually. That is very exciting, and I'm sure that you wouldn't answer the questions if I asked you what are you going to ask the new minister. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I know that those questions will be in safe hands, and and I guess uh, for, from someone like myself, and I, obviously I know the IAC. When the IAC was created, I was an advisory board to to the board of the agency. Do you feel that it's a, it's a board that has influence and has, I guess, power to to change and, and make you know, help the advocate yeah. for who we as an as a, as a cohort are? Yeah, I'm a relatively new member to the IAC. I've only been there since July last year. I've been involved with the IAC for several years before that because I was a member of the um, self management reference group for the IAC. But I've only been a full member uh, appointed by the minister in July last year. So I believe that the IAC has a lot more to offer than has been taken advantage of to date. But I also feel the power swelling and growing within the IAC to make that happen. So I, I and I feel that the change of minister is a positive step for the NDIS uh, and for the IAC. Uh, and her willingness to engage with us so quickly after her appointment is really encouraging. Wonderful. Well, that is good news. I have to say I held uh, Minister Robert in fairly high regards. I, li- I liked the fact that he had a technology bent to him and I felt there was going to be some, some real movement at the back end of the, uh, the, the, you know, the systems that we all use and have had some frustrations with. So to the fact that you think the new minister is equally a, a step up or certainly a, a useful addition to the team, then that's, that's fun- wonderful. Yeah, I think they'll have different strengths. They'll have different strengths, Max. I think uh, Minister Roberts uh, had some real strengths in the technology side of things, um, and I'm I'm hoping that um, Minister Reynolds has um, other strengths also to add to the add to the game. It's good. Excellent. Now, uh, obviously, I'm very keen, as you saw in the questions that I sent through to you, to talk to you about your view on support coordination. We, as an organisation, are very proud of the work that we do in in the support coordination field. And as I said to you, when we started this podcast that, you know, we've always looked up to the, the growing spaces as, you know, as people that are best in, best in practice, best on ground, uh, keen to understand from your perspective in, internally, what, what do you think makes a good support coordinator? Yeah, sure. Look, it's really interesting you actually say that, Max, because every time I look at the work we do, I, I see some pockets of, you know, brilliance and great work, but I also see room for massive improvement. I think there's just so much more that support coordinators can do across the country to do a better job. I just, I think we've got a long way to go. I think we're still in our infancy in the work that we deliver. And I don't think the the, you know, the growing space is not necessarily all that much better than anyone else in that regard. I think we've got a lot of growing to do. But what makes a good support coordinator? Wow, that's going to depend 
on the person that they're serving and what their needs are. So every person is going to need a slightly different skill set from their coordinator. Um, So I think it's really important first to find a really good match. If a participant doesn't have a good connection with their support coordinator, they're probably not going to get the best out of them. So building that relationship and that uh, that that trust in each other is absolutely paramount because, you know, we're the people that they should be calling if they're in a crisis. Now, obviously, natural supports, friends and family are the first people that you call. But when that crisis is related to your disability and your disability supports, you want the person to feel really confident and comfortable and safe to call their support coordinator. And I think that's really important. So I think we find there are a lot of participants out there who don't yet have a strong voice. And we've got a really important role in helping them build that voice. And we want them to feel safe and secure that if they don't like their support provider, if they don't like some of their workers or their SIL provider or something's going pear-shaped somewhere and they're not comfortable to say that directly to their providers, that they can call us so that we can get on it and help them represent that. So I think that's really important. Is there a risk, though, that they're starting to then do some other, uh, ex- they're extending the role of a support coordinator to where a traditionally an advocate would have, have t- played a part, which is obviously something that we've been expressly mm, told I that think, we're not entitled to do or not supposed to do? Yeah, no, I think that there's a big role for a coordinator before advocacy. Advocacy is when you can't resolve it on your own, and I think a support coordinator is the first step. And if you can't resolve it with your coordinator, if, it, if it's not working as the bridge, then that's the time to go to an advocate, well and truly. You want to know more? Do you want me to go through my list here, Max, or how do you want me to do this? Oh, if you've got a list, <laughs> I'd love that. That would be fantastic. I've got, is my there list. A list? I've got my list for you. All right. What makes a really good support coordinator? Someone that is reliable and consistent. Yep. Someone that gets back to you within a business day or two or whatever your arrangement is with that coordinator. And that's something else. Those expectations should be set really early. So right at the beginning of your relationship, your coordinator should be saying to you, you can expect me to get back to you within two business days or within one business day or within a week or whatever it is that you agree on together. And it will be different for different participants. I think coordinators need to do a really a better job at setting their boundaries and limitations of what, what work it is that they can do and can't do. Uh, And that participants, that coordinators need to be, need to know that participants are understanding that and working with them on that. I think that's important. I think a good coordinator is really well networked in the community. So they really know what's out there down to potentially even who the local scout troop is and which scout troops got the great leader that's more inclusive Mm. than the other one. And network just in general. You know, for me personally, it means that when I go to the supermarket, I look at the notice board. And I look at all the just things that are happening in my area. You know, I go to my local library. I look at those notice boards. I'm I'm a member of, um, what's it called? Is it Next Door? There's a website that you can join and it's part of your local community and people put up posts right down to, you know, who's a local plumber that's doing good work, but also about other things that are broader, broader context for the community. So I think that's important, that geographic work. A good support coordinator is well beyond someone that simply finds you an OT or a speechy or a support worker. I think those are core elements of the role, but I think the bigger role is looking at life from a bigger perspective. So looking at life planning, looking at crisis management, looking at preventing crises. You know, what can we do as support coordinators to make sure that crises don't happen? What are the plans for if mum, who's your primary carer, falls over and needs to go to hospital for a week? How's that going to look? A good coordinator will have plans in place, working with the participant to develop them Mm. and figure out Mm. what happens in those situations. Do you want more, Max? I can keep going. I do. I'm loving this. Yeah, no, no, please (laughs) keep going. All good. I think a really good support coordinator will look at really inclusive opportunities. So rather than sending one immediately, somebody immediately and suggesting, oh, here's some great day options programs and here's a great, you know, uh, employment enterprise sheltered workshop type of environment. um, Let's look at what we can do that's in the community. Where can we volunteer? How can we set up a small business? How can we get some time working in the local cafe or the local legal office or whatever it is that yanks somebody's chain rather than just going immediately to those stock standard disability. We call them service land. 
You know, we, yeah. we try yeah. to avoid service land at all costs <laughs> and just be part of the real world. This was really pointed out to me very clearly recently. Uh, my son is going to be moving out in the next year or two and we've got a property lined up. And I was at the property the other day and I was talking to the new neighbour. We've got these neighbours now. Yep. And I said, oh, hi, you know, I'm Sam and my son is going to be living here in a while. And they immediately said, oh, we know, we know him. My wife met, met him at the bus stop three years ago and they talk at the bus stop every time they're at the bus stop. And I can't help but think that if my son were going to a, a special school or special class at the time, he would have been in a special taxi going to a school on the other side of town or at least a distance away, whereas by going to his local school and having been taught how to catch the local bus, he now has a connection with his community who now Amazing. almost inexplicably is going to be his new neighbour who is yep. now not scared of him and is now willing to engage and be involved and keep an eye out and be part of his community. And yep. I think we have to work really hard as coordinators to promote that level of inclusion. So no more community tourism. You don't just go with a support worker to the beach. You don't just go to the shopping mall with a support worker. You meet up with your friends. You build yep. networks. Yeah, that's very powerful. So I think it's really important. And then the last one is sort of in tune with that, and that is that as a coordinator and or this one can be hard for people, for coordinators to do and for participants to accept. But I think our role is to stretch participants and to stretch families, particularly stretching families to let go a little bit of the people that they love to allow them to live a big life and not a closed yeah. small life. So if we can slowly but surely introduce the concept of joining Toastmasters instead of going to speech therapy every week, then yep. that's what we should be doing. And we don't want to shove it down anybody's throats, but we certainly should be supporting participants and families to think about those other opportunities in the community. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Yep. That's a great list. And actually, I was sort of when, when you first mentioned that you thought the support coordinators have a long way to go, including mm. yourself, and, and I'm sure you say the same. I was interested to say, where, well, where, where do we, where is, where is the future? Where does the future lie for support? Is what is the, 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 you know, if you had the crystal ball and the grand scheme and the magic wand to wave at, at support coordinators, what would they be del delivering? But what you've just mentioned there is fantastic. Would you add anything else if you could, you know, fast forward four or five years for, for support coordinators? I think it's just about living a large life, being employed in the community, being part of your community, uh, having your own family and relationships and living in your own homes, not living in you know many institutions where, with a bunch mm -hmm. of people that you have nothing in common with except the level of profundity of your disability. That, that outrages me mm -hmm. consistently. Well, look, that's a fabulous list. I, I've, I've written down a couple of them and I'm definitely going to get some transcripts from this to try and talk to the team about <laughs> And I guess, you know, then the flip side of that is, you know, and, and you've, you've mentioned some of the expectations around what individuals should expect from support coordinators. Would you add anything else to that? I mean, obviously, you, you yeah, mentioned yeah, sure. inclusivity. What, what else can someone expect from, a, from the, you know, if, if, you're the, if you're delivering as a support coordinator, what, what does that look like? I think there's some really basic stuff that not all coordinators are doing, and it won't be called for in every coordinator relationship with a participant. But obviously, that whole... I think it's a big leap to go from uh, having been block funded and just doing whatever was available to here is a budget of sometimes many hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes fives or tens of thousands of dollars. Certainly everywhere is somewhere, everyone is somewhere in between to actually understand that budget and what it means. Because the number of times you, you speak to a participant or a family and they've got their plan and it's $40,000 and they're thinking, yay, wow, we can do anything with that. But then the reality is that $40,000 actually doesn't buy all that much in terms of support work on a daily basis. It really buys very little. So to build those budgets and to monitor those budgets and to support people to make, to understand what their priorities are and how to use their funds and, of course, to support them to um, appeal for more funding if that's what is required, if they really do need that. So I think that's important. I think another expectation that we do at the growing space, and I'm not sure if your guys do this, Max, so I'm, I hope I haven't put you in the spot, <laughs> but we are 100% transparent 
in our case noting. So every uh, email that we send, every case note that we write in our system is also emailed to our participants and nominees. So they know exactly what work we're doing, what to expect, what we said we would do, what they said they would do. We think that that makes for a situation where we don't get ourselves in trouble with miscommunications because the nominee can read that email and say, oh, yeah, I have to call the OT, rather than us meeting them a month later and them saying, oh, I thought you were going to call the OT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which just makes frustrations for everybody and doesn't lead to the best outcome. So if we're really serious about good outcomes, we've got to have clear and transparent communications with our participants and nominees. Right. Well, no, we don't do that. I, I mean, when you said transparency, sorry, I mean, we are. Very, sorry. No, 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 please don't be sorry. <laughs> we, we are transparent about everything that we do and if anybody would like them. But that's a fantastic idea. And as you say, it actually expediates the, the you know things that need to be done by it any does. of the parties that are involved, any of the stakeholders. And if another, you say, will get it. Sorry, go on. Yeah, there's, there's some extra benefits too. Um, there's a lot of distrust in the disability sector. A lot of participants have been... Am I allowed to swear, swear on here, Max? You can do say it's, it's my podcast. You yeah. can do <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, a lot of participants have been screwed over by support providers in the past and they don't trust them. And if you put this stuff out there and in the open, you are opening up that relationship. It also means that your coordinators behave better because the words that they write in their case notes are non-judgmental. We had an example, Max, where a participant, a coordinator, wrote in the case notes that they were worried about somebody's drinking problem. And I asked the coordinator why they thought that, and they said, oh, well, I've never seen this before, but there were rows of boxes of beer cans on the outside of their house on my last visit. And and I just turned to the coordinator and said, mate, you know they're collecting cans for the scouts? (laughs) Right? And I just felt like, wow, we really have to be careful about what it is we record on those case notes because they're there, those notes are there forever. And if we say mm-hmm. we're worried about alcoholism, what is the what are the flow on effects from that? There's potentially some real issues there. So we have to be really objective about what we write in our case notes. We can't say that someone was sad because she had a fight with her mother. We need to say uh, so and so was crying and stated that she was yep. sad about a fight she had with her mother. We can't make that call. We don't know those people. That's just not it's not our call to make as coordinators. So, yes. And as I say, that that level of um, capacity for that note taking that you've just mentioned is is exactly why we believe this, you know, support coordination is a complex role not to be performed not to be just taken up by anybody that thinks that, oh, I've done some social work or I've done a bit of this or I've done some care or I've done, you know, it's actually a complex role. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. It does, it does. And I love the transparency. I, we'll mention it to the coaches that we have tomorrow and see where, <laughs> see where we go. With. Just yeah. be aware, Max, you will get a lot of resistance. But if you start off new tem- team members with that expectation, it will just come naturally. Well, that, and and resistance is fine. We have resistance at the moment because we have an internal project called Budget Builder, which is a tool that breaks down people's plans. And my view is that everybody that's an Auscare support client should have that for free, and then we could do that as a fee for service for other clients. And this is not supposed to be a plug for that, but there has been some reluctance to do that breakdown. So when someone gets a plan to break it down by service line and, and by month, it doesn't take that long once you get proficient at it, but there has been some pushback. So again, we have that service that we say, and this is a conversation I'm having with the team tomorrow. So mm. it's a bit of a, we're looking a bit at of doing a, something like that. So maybe we should talk about that, Max. We can talk. Mm. And, and I guess the big question for, for me, and I've had some uh, some feedback anecdotally from uh, from LACs that the future of support coordination is not looking as bright and rosy as we had hoped. I would I disagree with that. Uh, yeah, no, so I'm ple- pleased you would because I disagreed with it. I, I pushed back and said, mm-hmm. well, there's plenty of space for it. And also what we do is we feel confident about what we offer as a service, uh, you know, as a, as a provider. For you and, and, and your pushback on that, what is the future for support coordination? I think that all of the boring rubbish that coordinators do, like finding an OT and when they're available and what suburb they're in, which really is just such a grave waste of the skill and talent of our coordinators 
I think that stuff will go to the LACs. In fact, almost, I have almost no doubt about that. And in fact, internally at the growing space, we've already outsourced that by hiring researchers to do that lower level work. Yep. So we have other people doing that because the strengths of our coordinators are around crisis management and relationship building and inclusion and all of those other things that we just talked about. So mm. having a you know developmental educator with a rehab degree and master's calling up 12 OT companies to find out who's got space is just ridiculous and paying $193 an hour for that is also ridiculous. So I think that work will end up going to the LACs, but I think that there will always be a place for the sorts of work that we were just talking about, that crisis management, that life planning, housing, really figuring out what people want to do, employment, all of those other bigger picture things. I have no doubt that those things will stay in the coordination space and there will always be work like that. I don't know about you, Max, but we're turning away dozens of clients a day at the moment. Well, so. we, I wish we could. Well, we're not turning away any clients actually at the moment, but which is good. We don't have the floodgates open, but I, I'm pleased with what you've just said. We, we believe that that's the, the, the future, as you've just mentioned, the specializations and, and the deeper dives rather than, as you say, just calling 12 OTs and finding out who's got capacity to take on a client. Yeah, that's uh, that's encouraging from our, from our perspective, but also, I mean, we're we're fairly bullish about you know just what we do in the NDIS space. You know, we we feel confident that there's a future for for yeah. us and good support coordinators. So we're confident. I think that's the thing, Max. If you provide a really high quality service and you're nimble and you can shift as needed, there is always going to be room for you. Always, mm. the, the the NDIS is a big ticket item. Mm. And there are a lot of people out there that have been neglected for a very long time. And we've, I think we've got a lot of good stuff to offer those people. And I'm excited about that. And, and of course, our team are all people with disability or carers. So they've all yep. got that lived experience as well, which adds that extra layer sometimes. Actually, this is, a, this is not on the questions, but I'm keen to ask you. We, we used to have a policy where that was a sort of a affirmatively choosing people with a disability to, to work in the team. We, we found that hard to continue and that we weren't getting the, the level of applications. I know that it's something that you have been very proud of and communicate very, very strongly. Is it something that you found as a challenge to, to the grow growth of the growing space or is it something that... Yeah, because, huge challenge. Yeah. Huge challenge, but I think it's integral for our quality and it's something that helps us stand apart so it's important to us it's a big challenge from a number of perspectives it's a challenge in terms of recruitment it means that nobody is really available to do full-time or very few so practically yeah. all of our people work part-time and that comes with its own sort of expense challenges etc and it also means that you know there are periods of time where coordinators are out of action because mm. they're dealing with either their own support needs or with the support needs of the person that they love when they go into crisis. But I can also say that when you've got a team of people that are in that boat, they all support each other beautifully. Like mm. I can I can say hand on heart that I believe our team members genuinely love each other. Mm. That's super cool. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that. That is amazing. I, I have to say something when I – we do have a monthly Zoom and, and I'm jumping on that tomorrow with the team. And when I look around and go, yeah, the, these individuals all, are, we're all pulling in the same direction and there's a lot of trust there. It's uh, brilliant, a lot, of isn't it? a lot of trust there. And it's amazing when you look around and go, yeah, we're, we're, we're making stuff. You know, you can just almost feel that collective energy, which is pretty empowering. Yeah, it's great. And it, go, and it goes both ways. You know, you share the triumphs and the disasters. Oh, 100%. And, you supported, yeah, yeah. and supported in both ways. In fact, at the beginning of our team meeting, Max, I don't know, you probably do this as well, we do a goal kicks and cock-ups. So every person oh, really? needs to talk <laughs> about what they've, what, what's been fantastic, what goals have been kicked with a participant it, and yeah, also yeah. where they've mucked up or they could have done a whole lot better so that the whole team can learn from that because we are well, very fallible human people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like to try and put, per se that to my to my team. I, I often say, you know, we'll, we'll be trying to convey that vulnerability. I don't know if we've done that yet. I'm going to steal a lot of your uh, your IP here, Sam. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Am I on commission, Max? <laughs> yeah, oh, of course. Uh, no, so, which obviously brings us on to some of the more poignant topics. We've we've talked about internally the role of in, well, the, the change to independent assessments and obviously keen to hear your thoughts on them. My view and someone that shared it with me was that it was a positive thing for the NDIS and for participants and, and that they defended that statement because I was intrigued by it. They defended that statement by saying, 
the current system favors those people who are more well prepared, more well educated, or more well supported by other nominees. And therefore, there was a sort of a gaming of the system. Now, that's that's my words, not theirs. A gaming of the system for people that are better prepared. And therefore, they thought the independent assessments would reduce that. I don't know it well enough to have a view, particularly. I'm keen to hear mm. your thoughts. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that there is a current gaming of the system at some level, but I think it's it's minimal in terms of I don't think people are getting a whole lot of money that they're throwing away on, you know, holidays with grandma and grandpa and aunties and uncles to, you know, Hawaii. I don't think that stuff's happening no. um, or very, very, few, very little of that. But I am not 100% confident that independent assessments will actually address that because I still think that those that are at that level of, intense gamifying <laughs> yep. we'll still be able to do that in any system but that said max i do believe that there is a place for independent assessments in the scheme but i do think that it's in a broader context i think the reason that people do somewhat gamify the system now or game the system now is because we don't have those other tiers of support in the community so what the LACs should have been doing and what the ILC projects should be doing is supporting people such that they don't actually need those intensive one-to-one support packages that we have through the NDIS or that they need smaller packages because the community is actually doing stuff. So, Mm -hmm. for example, with my own son, we have what's called a circle of support. So we pay a facilitator who works with a group of people who were pulled from the community to be part of Ben's life and to help him, you know, ostensibly to help him now, but also in the event that I get hit by a bus, there is a group of people around him that will always be able to be with him. Now, we pay the facilitator, I think it's about seven or $8,000 a year for that service, but I estimate that we have saved at least $30,000 a year in support costs because it's usually on the weekends, Saturday nights and Sundays, that they take him out. They go to the basketball, they go to a live music gig, they go out for dinner, they drink beers, they teach him how to weld. You know, all sorts of stuff is happening out there. And if we had support for those kinds of things, we wouldn't need those massive packages. One of the problems is that we just don't have that bigger picture support for people with disabilities. Obviously, there's always going to be a base level of support that people are going to need. And the IAs are an attempt to address that base level of support but without all of the other things in place, is it going to be enough? Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced. So I do believe that IAs are a piece of the puzzle, but they are not currently being implemented in a way that I think is good. And I also think that they've not been implemented without the support and voice and co-design of disabled people and families and carers. And I think that that's a, that's a grave, grave error, that they really needed to bring all of us along on that journey to make sure that it was going to be done well. Yeah, and, and it, it does seem to be very divisive. There seems to be a mm. lot of, if you, if you Google independence assessments, NDIS, which I did yesterday, you know, there's a, just negative, negative press, negative uh, responses. I would suggest to all of your listeners that they also listen to another podcast, which is the Disability Services Consulting one, The Disability Done yep. Different. Just yep. They've just released one by John Walsh, which is all about the independent assessments and the general context of the scheme. And I highly, highly recommend that families listen to that, that participants listen to that, and certainly service providers as well. Anyone with skin in the game or an interest um, should be listening to that podcast. You'll learn a heap. I certainly did. Awesome. Um Awesome. Yeah. So obviously, the well, the next question was on the uh, the transition from uh, for partic- for participants, sorry, accessing accessing core, um, and the I guess how the growing space was managing that transition for participants and and uh, and the outcomes that we would have seen in the last I guess it's um, fourteen or fifteen days mm. since it ended. Yeah. Um, so you're asking about the support coordination no longer being available from core. So certainly we are very expensive support workers for those people that are self-managed. So, right. yep. Uh, we are also uh, very cheap capacity builders for many of our plan managed participants. Right. Um, uh, it's the agency managed participants who are missing out. Yeah. So they're the ones that we are not yet able to find a workaround, but 
we have workarounds available while we wait for reviews for those people that are self or plan managed. Another good reason to be self or plan managed. Which I possible. think is becoming more apparent. I mean, from, from what I've seen, there has been that sort of there is a seismic shift, isn't there? As far as I understand, the, the agency never wanted to have agency managed participants. That, that was originally sort of supposed to be you know, planned or self-managed. And it sort of came in the last the last minute and they'd prefer not to be, um, you know, not to have any of them as, as far as I'm aware. So look, we, we love plan management. We love what we do in the plan management space for, for the people that want to be plan managed by us. It, you know, we're looking at getting more and more efficient in that space and how do we pay people more quickly and how do we offer a sort of pseudo support coordination service, the budget builder that I was talking about. So we love yeah, plan awesome. management. And uh, we can't wait to see it just continue to to grow and evolve. I, I think there'll be a consolidation in the space, but you know we'll we'll wait and see. Uh, you know we're still self funded. We'll we'll see about the big big uh, big ticket items coming in. We've got a couple more questions to go. I'm, I'm very conscious of your time, so I guess uh, how does the growing space manage the lack of case management in support coordination roles? A question that I had from one of the coaches. Yeah. So case management. I mean, it it, it does have a role, and we do do it. For those people that are in the particularly sticky situations where they're under guardianship, for example, and there's not a nominee available to support somebody's support needs. I still don't like to call it case management, though, because I still like to think of ourselves as capacity builders. So we do whatever we can to help participants. I, I, look, I guess in truth, uh, social workers would say that case management should be a capacity building exercise as well. So I think it's just, look, I, I just think we're just talking about the same thing with different words. I don't think there's really any difference. Awesome. And so a personal interest of mine, psychosocial recovery coaches, I've mm. uh, <laughs> looked into this. I've actually been speaking to someone today that's got a, a sort of SaaS-based solution for the continual professional development that may enable us to, to move into the space. We're offering that to the coaches that we might have. We don't see a financial model yet. Is it something that you have looked into or you're you're shaking your head for those people that obviously... I'm not looking into it because we're not highly profitable doing coordination at 100 bucks an hour. So I just don't understand how we could possibly expect a psychosocial recovery coach to do the entire job of a support coordinator and be available around the clock and be paid 20 or $30 an hour less. It's not viable. I, I don't believe it's viable. I also personally don't have a lot of skill and experience in the mental health and psychosocial space, so it's not an area that we are looking at currently. I believe there are other other organisations that are better placed to do that work. We were visited by Minister Ward, the New South Wales Minister for Disabilities and Families. When I mentioned this to him, he was interested he'd not heard that there was an issue with the financial modeling of the psychosocial recovery coaches and he asked for a submission from myself which i have a, a draft of and I'm, I'm planning to send so at least in that respect there was some some move at the top end of the town to bring it to the table but yeah at the moment i can't see it as a as a viable solution either so it's interesting sam that's it from me at this stage i really appreciate your candor i really appreciate your time I can't wait to listen back to what makes a good support coordinator, the list that you provided to me. It gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Love what you're doing. Please continue to to shine the torch, fly the flag. You know, as I say, you you are an inspiration. I know you don't want to be uh, be lauded like that, but you are an inspiration to us in terms of, you know, particularly when you 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 we get the uh the press releases from the NDIA and we get the Sam Translates version of them. Those are our favorites. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, closing comments uh, I'll leave to you no I just thanks for the opportunity to chat Max you know I really want the quality of coordination around the country to lift because I think you know there's a lot of there's a lot of bad talk about coordinators and much of it is warranted so anything we can do to lift the lift the quality around the country uh, I am all for that and I want to thank you too for your support for through disability intermediaries Australia and and your you know, willingness all the way along to share your resources. I remember way back when I registered, I think I, I think I borrowed a whole kit of yours of all of the policies of things, which You're certainly right. helped me to develop my own. So uh, I've, I've always been very grateful for that. That was back when I was a one person band. So um, thank you very much for energies and, and sharing in the sector, Max. Appreciate it deeply. 
Well, I have to say, Sam, that's absolutely made my day. I remember when I put those uh, policies up, I think it was on Facebook, and I left, I, I shared them, and uh, my wife was telling me that I should charge people for them. And I, I just had this feeling that it was better for me to put them up there and for everyone to access them. So you've made my day that there's been a small part that we've played in. in, in you can just give the, your wife a told you so moment now. Yeah, no, I'm definitely doing that. She's having a baby <laughs> next week, so I'll be gentle. Oh, but, uh, congratulations, Max. That's so exciting. Well, do you already have children, Max? I have a 17-year-old boy uh, who's uh-huh. in year 12, so I thought I'd just go straight back to the beginning, which is pretty cool. I can't wait to meet him or her. We don't know what it is yet. So, oh, How exciting. Um, it is exciting. Awesome. All the very best. I look forward to photos online. Thank you. You will definitely see them. Thanks very much, Sam Payer, The Growing Take Space. Take care, Max. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed listening to Rock Solid People. For more interviews, stay tuned.